Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Chad Brummett. I'm an anesthesiologist and a pain physician at the University of Michigan, and I am very pleased to be here today to uh, kick off the first of two opioid summits uh, together between the University of Michigan and Harvard University. And I want to take a moment to uh, thank Mary Bassett from Harvard School of Public Health, who has been a, a co-convener and will be leading the Fall Opioid Summit, and we'll be giving you more information about that later. And I want to also thank all of the speakers. Uh, it, it is a remarkable list of speakers today, and I can say that um, each of these speakers could be giving a keynote at any international meeting, and, and everyone has agreed to do seven or eight minutes of high-level information and have some discussion, and I think that humility and the ability to pull back and really recognize that this is an opportunity to discuss and share is very powerful. We're pleased to have a variety of stakeholders partic participating in today's summit. Uh, joining us today, both in person and via our live webcast, include county, state, and federal government representatives public health departments, representatives from a variety of organizations that help shape public policy, uh, law enforcement and court professionals, health care providers and health plans, foundations, researchers, and then many from the community that are passionate and doing incredible work, uh, grassroots work throughout our communities in our state and our country. So thank you for, for engaging in this important event. Today would not have been possible without the financial support of our sponsors, so I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge them. Uh, specifically, uh, I, want to, I want to thank uh, the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation. The event staff from IHPI has just been remarkable. As you can see, bringing something like this together is a lot of work, and they really put in a lot of time, and it's just, they've been absolutely remarkable. I want to also thank my team from the Michigan Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network for their work, and in particular, um, the visual abstract work that you'll see um, via Twitter later today. I'd also like to thank our um, sponsors, uh, including SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, as a part of the Michigan open uh, SAMHSA SOR grant from MDHHS, and we have uh, members of the MDHHS SOR response here with us today. Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, Value Partnerships, the University of Michigan Injury Prevention Center, MISHER, the Michigan Institute for Clinical and Health Research, and the University of Michigan Precision Health Initiative. So help me thank them for their support. As you may have noticed, we've had a, a, a small change in our uh, keynote speaker today. Admiral Girard sends his regrets. He was called back to DC for an important meeting. However, we are very fortunate to have Rear Admiral Sylvia Trent Adams, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health in the US Department of Health and Human Services. And she's here with us to present the keynote address. And she is joined today in our opening panel by, two, by a two-time Michigan alumni, Carla Haddad, Senior Advisor on Opioid Policy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. So help me thank them for, for joining us today. Throughout the day, if you have questions for the panelists, we're gonna be receiving questions via text message, and this is the uh, texting number, so if you wanna take a picture or go ahead and put it in your phone, this is how we'll push questions through. Um, if you're on the live webcast, there is a Q&A section, and you can actually type your question into the Q&A section of the live webcast. And if you don't uh, want to text or do it via the live webcast, but you're here today, if you write uh, your question on a piece of paper, one of our event staff will take it. We will try to field as many questions as possible throughout the day. Uh, and I will also remind everybody that for, from a social media perspective, our hashtag today is hash, hashtag OPSummit19. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Schlissel, the 14th president of the University of Michigan and the first physician scientist to lead the institution. Since beginning as president in July of 2014, he has launched initiatives including academic innovation, biosciences, diversity, equity, and inclusion, poverty solutions, and the Precision Health Initiative. 
As part of his commitment to college affordability, President Slissel in June of 2017 announced the Go Blue Guarantee, a new financial aid program that provides up to four years of free undergraduate tuition to in-state students from families in Michigan making $65,000 or less. And that certainly deserves a round of applause. As a graduate of Princeton University, he earned his, both his MD and his PhD degrees from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He completed his residency in internal medicine from Johns Hopkins Hospital and conducted a postdoctoral research fellowship at the Bristol Myers Cancer Research Fellow under David Baltimore at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Whitehead Institute. His research has focused on the development of biology of B cell lymphocytes and the cell type in the immune system that secretes antibodies. His work has contributed to detailed understanding of genetic factors involved in the production of antibodies and how, mis and how mistakes in that process can lead to leukemia and, lo and lymphoma. So please help me in welcoming President Mark Schlissel. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Chad, for that uh, kind introduction, but more importantly, for your uh, leadership in helping launch uh, this uh, collaboration and pulling together this really remarkable meeting uh, with a, a diverse and important audience. Uh, I want to add my uh, thanks uh, to Dr. Brummitz, uh, to everyone who's engaging in the effort to provide solutions for our nation's opioid crisis. I especially welcome our Harvard colleagues, the researchers and scholars and partners from all across the University of Michigan community, the leaders from our state and beyond, and of course all of today's speakers, panelists, and performers. You're in for a treat of performance a bit later today. Um, we know that opioid overdoses kill an average of 130 people each day in the United States, making it the deadliest drug, drug epidemic in our nation's history. These tragedies cost our economy an estimated $115 billion per year. And that doesn't even begin to measure the heartache and the loss felt by families and loved ones of the deceased. University of Michigan Medical School professors Amy Bonnert and Mark Ilgen have found that opioids are a key contributor to the rise in suicides and drug overdoses among American adults. The rate today is twice what it was less than two decades ago. We face an epidemic that affects everyone, spanning urban and rural communities, adolescents and the elderly, all races and socioeconomic levels. Yet our society too often works on such problems in silos, bounded by state or campus or jurisdictional borders. University of Michigan professor Rebecca Hafiji of our School of Public Health has examined some of these challenges. She notes that although states and local localities are at the very forefront and have been very active in the policymaking space, there's often not good evidence about the efficacy of many policies. For instance, she describes laws that limit the dosage or number of days a prescription can be written for as very blunt instruments. And a policy that's working in one state doesn't necessarily work in another. Today we come together not only to address a crisis, but also to share hope. Though both Harvard and the University of Michigan have long and distinguished track records in addressing societal problems, our partnership allows us to aim higher and to seize a tremendous opportunity to leverage our impact. We unite the academic prowess of two great universities, each with outstanding research productivity, global influence, and a commitment to partnerships with the communities that we serve. We reach across disciplinary boundaries, collaborating with experts and practitioners from government, and medicine, pharmacy, public health, law, criminal justice, and many other areas. And we pursue solutions together that can be shared and applied across the breadth of society as policies grounded in evidence. I hope that the work we do with this partnership provides an inspirational and intellectual model for others to follow. Because as our world becomes smaller, the inverse is true of our problems. They get bigger and more complex, and they'll not be solved in isolation. Together, we understand that major challenges demand collaboration. I'm proud to help support a great partnership that has the potential to mean so much to the world we share. 
I want to take a moment to thank my friend and colleague, Harvard President Larry Bacow, for his commitment to this partnership. Uh, I was most impressed that uh, President Bacow, in the early days of his presidency, said that he wants to extend Harvard's influence and presence more broadly across the United States. And it's to our great benefit that he's a native Michigander. He grew up in Pontiac. Uh, so for him, it's like coming home. And he would tell me stories of him being an usher in Michigan Stadium. So I invited him back to the box in Michigan Stadium. Uh, but he's very eager to collaborate. And the complementarity between our two great institutions, uh, I would argue this is only a first step in a broadening relationship between uh, a great private university and a great public institution. We've been working to foster collaborations within the University of Michigan and with stakeholders all around our state. Last fall, we launched the Opioid Solutions Network, a resource that serves as a central hub for U of M's research, education, and community engagement related to opioids. The creation and development of the Opioid Solutions was led by Dr. Rebecca Cunningham, our incoming Vice President for, uh, Interim Vice President for Research. Uh, it includes tools for researchers and information resources for patients and can be viewed at opioids.umich.edu. Opioid Solutions was a key enhancement for us because it supports the level of collaboration that I mentioned are essential for us to make a difference. U of M has nearly 100 faculty members conducting research on opioid prescription, misuse, and overdose. They work in dozens of departments, centers, and institutes all across our institution. The Michigan Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network, or Michigan Open that you heard about a moment ago, was founded in 2016 and focuses on optimizing opioid prescribing practices after surgery, dentistry, and emergency room visits, and promoting the safe disposal of unused pills. It's developed evidence-based prescribing recommendations and helped more than 50 communities dispose of thousands of unused pills. Michigan Open is funded by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to engage hospitals participating in Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan's value partnership collaboratives. We've also invested resources in university-wide research in this area. A year and a half ago, we launched our Precision Health Initiative to examine the interaction of genes, environment, and behavior in health and disease. One of the initiative's first projects is an effort to identify genetic and biochemical markers that predict a surgical patient's post-op pain medication requirements. Last year, our Office of Academic Innovation partnered with our Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation on a teach-out focusing on opioids. I love this concept of a teach-out. The name harkens back to the anti-war teach-ins born here at the University of Michigan back in the 1960s but with a decidedly modern approach. Teachouts are short online learning experiences focused on a specific current issue. Learners come from all around the world and engage with faculty and each other as they examine the issue together. Those of us who are academics in the room can appreciate how remarkable it is that a teachout on an emerging topic can come together and be launched in a matter of just a few weeks versus the much longer, lengthier lead time we need for a traditional class. Our opioid teach-out had more than 3,000 participants. Before I introduce this morning's keynote speaker, I want to commend several Michigan leaders who are helping to address the opioid epidemic. Our new governor, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, has called the epidemic one of the greatest health crises of our lifetime and said we need to marshal all forces necessary to fight back. The first bill she signed into law retained a judgeship in the Upper Peninsula that was set to be eliminated. This judge will establish a special court in the Upper Peninsula to give residents struggling with addiction access to treatment rather than incarceration. Also in March, her advocacy contributed to the announcement by the Bloomberg Philanthropies that Michigan would receive $10 million to address overdose deaths. U.S. Congressional Representatives Debbie Dingell and Fred Upton, who sit on opposite sides of the aisle, have introduced legislation to promote opioid research. Their joint op-ed a year ago in the Detroit Free Press expressed some of the values that we seek to advance here at today's summit. While it is true there is no magic wand to address this issue, they wrote, we must recognize that if we're going to achieve an addiction-free nation, it will depend on smart science and a regulatory environment that promotes pain management alternatives. 
Using better science to understand the biology of pain and addiction is the first step in combating this devastating crisis, they wrote. I want to thank you all again for engaging with us today. You're part of the critical mass of expertise that will create better, lasting solutions to this epidemic and change the lives of literally millions of people throughout the nation. So thank you all very, very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce Rear Admiral Sylvia Trent Adams, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Health at the US Department of Health and Human Services. Dr. Trent Adams earned her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Hampton University, a Master of Science in Nursing and Health Policy from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and a PhD in Public Policy from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. She became a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing in 2014, and in 2018 was elected to the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academies of Practice. In 2017, she received the International Red Cross Florence Nightingale Medal, the highest international honor bestowed on a nurse. Dr. Trent Adams served as a nurse officer in the US Army and as a research nurse at the University of Maryland. Her clinical practice was in trauma, oncology, community health, and infectious disease. Her federal experience also includes service as Deputy Surgeon General of the US Public Health Service Commission Corps, where her work included combating the opioid crisis. As a leader in the HIV AIDS Bureau, she assisted in managing the Ryan White Program, which funds care, referrals, and support services for uninsured and underserved people living with HIV and provides training for healthcare professionals. In her current role, she shares responsibility for policy and program development and priorities in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Please help me welcome Rear Admiral Sylvia Trent Adams. Good morning, everyone. OK, this is Harvard in Michigan. Good morning. That's better. OK, well, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. And Admiral Jawar was devastated that he was able to be here. I'm sure he prefers to be here than in DC right about now, because he's spending a lot of time on the Hill. Um, but I want to say thank you to the University of Michigan and to Harvard University for hosting this opioid summit, because this, this really is, as the governor said, one of the most severe crises of our, of our, of our lifetime. And we are doing everything we possibly can at the federal level um, to combat the opioid crisis, but also working with the states and local jurisdictions to make sure that everything that we can do is implemented as, as timely as possible. Um, you know, this issue is very personal to many of us, um, both from a clinical standpoint as well as from a personal standpoint. Uh, our Surgeon General has talked very openly about his personal um, situation with his brother uh, being incarcerated for um, a mental health condition that led him to a life of addiction. And he talks about how that has impacted him and his perspective on how healthcare can fail, how healthcare and social services do not always collide into a positive outcome. But we know that for each and every one of us, this is an, it's a daily commitment that we're making at HHS to address the many challenges of the opioid crisis. I wanna thank President Slichel and the Chairs, Drs. Brown and Bassett, for your support in this important effort. This is one of the most important things we'll do, um, I think, in my career, as, at least in, for whatever's left of my career, because I'm hoping to retire soon, but that's not working out for me. <laughs> I've had three dates, and I'm, not, I'm failing on, on success. <laughs> but however, this is something uh, that wakes me up at night. How do you look into the data how do you explore care delivery systems and accept that where we are is no better than where we've been? It's actually getting worse. But there are some glimmers of hope, and I hope to, to today share with you some of the um, opportunities that we have in front of us, but also some of the success we've enjoyed uh, as we've implemented some of the programs across HHS. So the, the opioid crisis is one of the most pressing public health challenges in the United States. While there are multiple data sources um, out there, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health give us our most robust data on the state of opioid misuse in this country. The latest data from 2017 indicates that about 11.4 million Americans misuse opioids in the past year. 
and 2.1 million Americans had an opioid use disorder. Approximately 53% of individuals still receive their pain reliever from a friend or relative. So the extra pain relievers that are in the medicine cabinet at home are still a significant concern across the country. The most common reason for opioid misuse is pain. So where are we in terms of the latest drug overdose death counts? Last November, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released the final 2017 drug overdose numbers. In 2017, 70,237 people in the United States died due to drug overdoses. Among those, 47,600 died of, of opioid overdoses. This is predominantly caused by illicit synthetic opioids like fentanyl, which we still have a lot of work to do in controlling the fentanyl um, crisis. Uh, CDC also tracks provisional 12-month overdose mortality data on a monthly basis, and you can see the trend on this slide. Although overdose deaths were significantly higher in 2017 than in 2016, the rapid increase in overdose deaths began to flatten in late 2017. And mortality data through September 2018 demonstrates a very slow but definitely definite decrease in overdose deaths. This is despite the deaths from fentanyl and psychostimulants that continue to be on the rise. This map shows the percentage, percentage change in drug overdose deaths from September 2017 to September 2018. Some states have made great progress in reducing the number of drug overdose deaths over the 12-month period. Ohio, one of the hardest hit states by the opioid epidemic, is down nearly 22% from the previous rolling year in 2017. Deaths in Pennsylvania have decreased by 18.5%. And you can see the similar patterns in other states like New Hampshire and Iowa. So some progress is being made. We're making good progress in these states, but there's still more work to do. Uh, unfortunately, we're seeing trends in the opposite direction in the Western region, primarily due to the increase in the use of psychostimulants like methamphetamine, and this is especially concerning that um, the department, so the department is taking a very serious look at this. We know that there are some, um, some data sources in states that are not national and we're working to coordinate um, using that data as in, for comparison pur purposes. This slide breaks down the drug overdose deaths by opioid type. Synthetic opioids, heroin, natural and semi-synthetic opioids such as morphine and oxycodone, and more, more methadone, commonly used to, to treat um, opioid addiction. Death counts involving heroin and semi-synthetic opioids like prescription opioids have remained stable and plateaued in 2016 to 2017. Synthetic opioids like fentanyl have spiked dramatically since 2013 and are currently the main driver for the drug overdose deaths. Infiltration of synthetic opioids in the illicit drug supply is having a devastating effect. We're seeing that deaths involving synthetic opioids and deaths involving other community, community commonly um, abused drugs, cocaine and psychostimulants, primarily methamphetamine, have been increasing in recent years. So this table looks at the percentage change in overdose mortality by class of drugs from September 2017 to 2018. The country is seeing good progress in reducing the number of opioid deaths involving heroin, prescription drugs, and uh, prescription opioids, I'm sorry, and methadone. Deaths involving synthetic opioids are still increasing and are almost up, up almost 14% from the previous year in 2017. And again, we see the psychostimulants and cocaine are reemerging re as a major cause of drug overdoses. In fact, deaths involving psychostimulants have increased by nearly 25% from the previous year in 2017. And as you can see, um, what's starting to happen is the focus on um, methamphetamine is, is shadow, overshadowing um, synthetic opioids and the opioid, um, uh, and the opioid epidemic in general. And so the provisional data from the Centers for Disease Control's um, National Center for Health Statistics indicates that there are several states that are having more overdose deaths involving psychostimulants and synthetic opioids. Among those that we have data from, so five of the 18 states that have more overdose deaths involving psychostimulants than synthetic opioids, this is an area where we really need to, to focus in on. 
So taking a closer look at California, uh, for example, the drug overdose deaths involving synthetic opioids and psychostimulants have been increasing since 2012. But deaths involving psychostimulants have increased at a much faster rate and a much faster pace um, than, than the other areas. <coughs> These sorts of data indicate that some states have more of an issue with psychostimulants, again, like methamphetamine, than synthetics and that our policies and approaches need to adapt based on these, on these new emerging trends. Now I wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about um, a few of the public health issues. So this public health crisis has led to devastating consequences, including um, increases in opioid use and related overdoses, as well as rising incidence of neonatal abstinence syndrome, or NAS, due to the opioid use during, and misuse during pregnancy. NAS is a drug withdrawal syndrome that most commonly occurs when infants are exposed in utero to opioids. In addition to NAS, prenatal opioid exposure has also been associated with poor fetal growth, preterm birth, stillbirth, and possible birth side effects such as um, major birth defects. There, this report in particular um, linking gastrocytosis to opioid prescriptions and use during pregnancy is very concerning as well. We're starting to see these associations where the opioid prescription rates are going up and it correlates significantly with the opioid use and misuse among mothers in these regions where we're collecting data. This recent publication in the American Journal of Public Health summarizes very well the type and approach we need to take to combat opioid addiction in America. No single policy is going to um, be large enough or be significant enough to impact one so a solution. We know that we need to reduce the deaths, but it's gonna take a whole of government, it's gonna take every sector of society, and it's gonna take a combination of approaches and interventions needed to really make a difference so that every individual in every community can have access to the prevention, treatment, and recovery services that are needed. Well, recognizing the size and scope of this crisis, in, in 2017, HHS developed a five-point opioid response strategy. And the five points include improving access to prevention, treatment and recovery services, emphasizing the critical importance of medication-assisted treatment as a component of evidence-based therapy, strengthening public health data, reporting, and collection to inform real-time response, Part of our, our major challenge in the, early in the opioid epidemic was the lag time for getting opioid data compiled and analyzed to be able to identify trends or even to see surges of need in, in given communities across the country. We want to advance the, the practice of pain management to decrease the inappropriate use of opioids, enhancing the availability of overdose reducing, overdose re re reversing medications, and also supporting cutting edge research which improves our understanding of pain, addiction, and also leads to new treatments and identifies effective public health interventions. In, 20, in 2018, HHS put out historic levels of grant funding, and many of the organizations in the room may have benefited from that funding. Um, the funding was to support scientific research, also to support and equip states with tools to track and report um, overdose and overdoses and deaths, and to build and strengthen um, comprehensive prevention programs, including prescription drug monitoring programs. Improving the practice of pain management is also critical because out of three out of four people who use heroin in the past year misuse prescription drugs first. As such, we have strongly supported the CDC's guidelines on opioid prescribing and have implemented new checks within, the C within CMS, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, to do what we can to minimize improper prescribing of opioids. Regarding overdose reversing drugs, HHS has emphasized the importance of widespread distribution of naloxone, either by direct distribution, by co-prescribing to patients at high risk of opioid overdose, but also educating the community on the importance of having opioid accessible in every community. Finally, we are supporting cutting edge research. NIH recently launched the Helping to End Addiction Long-Term Initiative, also known as HEAL with over $850 million in funding in 2018, focusing on the full spectrum of research and preventing and treating addiction. One of the signature NIH projects that will be funded through the HEAL initiative 
is the Healing Community Study. Through this study, HHS recently awarded over $350 million in grants to support a whole-of-government effort in Kentucky, Ohio, Massachusetts, and New York to reduce overdose deaths by 40% in these communities within three years. We understand that to effectively address the opioid epidemic in the United States, every community has to be engaged and every sector of the community has to be engaged. This includes physicians, nurses, patients, cops, courts, teachers, mayors, employers, parents, coaches, schools, social workers, faith leaders, everyone needs to be engaged and involved. But we know this is not going to be easy. This is the goal of the Healing Community Study. Admiral Jawar wanted me to share this slide with you because um, several weeks ago he had the opportunity and the privilege to brief the President on the progress made to date on our public health effort, efforts in combating the opioid crisis. While this crisis was decades in the making and will require a whole of society effort for many more years, there are many positive indicators that our efforts have, are having substantial effect and have made real progress, progress that is saving lives each and every day. And some of that progress is documented in the next couple of slides. So from, the, from, the, from, the beginning, from 20, January 2017 through February 2019, the initial market data suggests that the total amount of opioids being prescribed monthly has dropped by 34%. This success was achieved while the administration also emphasized the importance of appropriate opioid prescribing for patients experiencing severe pain and supported the use of the development of non-opioid treatments. Moving on to naloxone. Um, from January 2017 to February 2019, we have led a 484% increase in the naloxone prescriptions dispensed to pharmacies. Last spring, the Surgeon General issued a historic advisory urging Americans to carry naloxone, producing a 27% boost in prescribing immediately after the delivery of the advisory. Treatment. We must expand availability of treatment, and treatment in rural areas is, is, is vastly um, in, in a, is just in such um, deficit across every sector of this country. We have to make sure we're building capacity in the rural communities as well as making sure that those in urban areas have real-time access. So expanding the availability of treatment for Americans struggling with addiction is essential. And we know that medication-assisted treatment, or MAT, is the standard of care for opioid use disorder. From January 2017 to February 2019, there has been a 23% increase in the patients receiving buprenorphine and 42% increase in prescriptions for naltrexone, two forms of MAT. Our HRSA-funded community health centers of, um, across the country saw a 64% increase in patients receiving MAT from 2016 to 2017. And finally, as reported a couple of weeks ago, the 12-month rolling count of provisional overdose deaths dropped from for 70, for below 70,000 for the first time in a year. While this count is still staggering, we know that this is, this is one sign of progress. We all need to think about ways to help those struggling with addiction. It is not a, norm, it is not a moral failing, but a chronic disease that we need to treat as a chronic disease. As we look forward to the next year, we have several priorities that we'll be, we will be focusing on, and I would like to highlight just a few. First, it will be critical to broaden our focus to address the resurgence of methamphetamines and cocaine before they become the fourth wave of the overdose epidemic. We are seeing this happen already. We will also continue to focus on a whole of society approach to addressing the opioid addiction the, at the community level, working closely with our state, local, and tribal partners. And the recent passage of the massive opioid legislation, the Support for Patients and Communities Act, will enable HHS to um, build and expand our programs that align with the department's five-point opioid strategy. The Assistant Secretary wanted me to make sure I communicated to this group that there is a 25-page spreadsheet that he and other leaders within HHS are required to implement as a part of this act. And this is one of those benchmarks that the Secretary is using to assess progress and success on the goals and objectives that have been set by HHS in being able to combat the opioid crisis. More broadly, we have to transition away from a crisis environment. Um, this framework of being in this crisis mode, we have, to, we have to move out of that framework into an integrated, sustainable, predictable, and resilient public health system. 
which will address preventing and treating substance use and other behavioral um, disorders con con concurrently. For example, we need to align reimbursement so that people can get paid for the right therapy at the right time. In this area, CMS recently announced two new opioid alternative payment models that they're using to push out, that we'll be pushing out very soon. And I believe it's end of summer that you'll start to see more about this. The first one is the maternal opioid misuse or MOM model, which will partner with state Medicaid agencies to integrate a wide range of services for pregnant and postpartum women struggling with opioid misuse to ensure not only their health, but the well-being of, the, of their um, long-term recovery, but, and also to protect the health of their child as well. This model is also part of our efforts to move to a value-based care model, which will include focusing on prevention and the critical health needs of children, families, and communities. It aligns with um, another integrated model, which is the integrated care for kids model the first child and family-centered model to improve quality of care and decrease costs through an integrated framework. Other priorities for the year include encouraging the expansion of comprehend comprehensive syringe services programs, enhancing emergency room MAT treatment and ensuring warm handoffs following an overdose, and improving MAT during transitions into and out of the criminal justice system, and these will be integrated into the long-term activities along HHS priorities. While I've discussed this, what I've discussed this morning are a number of initiatives at the federal level or supported by federal government funding. These, these activities will help tackle the opioid crisis across the country. But I wanna be clear that this is, a victor, this is not a victory that we will win alone. The federal government cannot do it by themselves. The feds can't do it alone, nor can a state do it by themselves. Professional societies and grassroots organizations cannot do it alone. Only by working together can we meet in the, at the precipice of this crisis and work together to delay the foundation for a healthier country ahead. However, we together can combat the opioid crisis. Many of you have already joined the fight through championing practices, changing practices within your, hospital, within your hospitals directing research in your clinics, creating new initiatives, supporting new treatment options for pain and addiction. Please, I ask you to remain focused and work with us. Continue the great work that you're doing. We look forward to opportunities to discuss with you more of what HHS is doing as a part of our panel discussion, but I wanna say thank you for what you've done so far and thank you for being here today to discuss this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to next invite uh, Dr. John Ianian from the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation uh, here to uh, introduce our speaker for the next panel. And if the panelists want to go ahead and come up, that'd be great. Good morning. I'm John Ianian. I'm the director of the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation, which is one of the partners helping to organize this event today. Uh, we are a campus-wide institute of over 600 faculty from 14 schools and colleges here at the University of Michigan, uh, working together on interdisciplinary research and policy to improve healthcare delivery and population health. And it's a great pleasure to be uh, one of the co-organizers of this event, along with the Michigan Opioid Prescribing Engagement Network. I, I would like to thank Trish Meyer and our staff team from the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation for doing such a great job organizing and publicizing today's event. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and this is also a, a, a fun day for me because I'm a graduate of Harvard Medical School and the Harvard Kennedy School, and I served on faculty there for 20 years before moving here to the great state of Michigan six years ago. So it's a, a real pleasure to welcome colleagues from Harvard and from Boston here to uh, our campus in Michigan and, uh, and to really partner, as President Schlissel was saying, with, with colleagues at both universities to uh, take steps to understand the origins and the ways we can 
address the opioid epidemic, uh, how we can provide better health care, and how we can influence policy and communicate the results that our researchers and faculty and students are developing on each of our campuses to really address this important problem. Uh, it's now my pleasure to moderate and introduce our panel, the first panel of the morning. Uh, first, we'll hear from Dr. Jonah Caldoun. Dr. Caldoun is the Chief Medical Executive and Chief Deputy for Health in the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, also known as MDHHS. In these roles, she provides overall guidance for the state of Michigan, and she oversees the department's programs in population health, medical services, elderly services, behavioral health, and developmental disabilities. Prior to her role at MDHHS, she was the Director and Health Officer for the Detroit Health Department, and she previously served as the Chief Medical Officer for the Baltimore City Health Department. Dr. Galtoon, Dr. Caldoun earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Michigan and her medical degree from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, next, we'll hear from Dr. Thomas Simmer. Dr. Simmer is the Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan where he oversees medical policy, professional payment policies, and national programs to improve quality, costs, and access to medical services. Under his leadership, Blue Cross has introduced physician incentive programs to promote cost-effective ways to prescribe drugs and to provide consistent care for people with chronic illness. Prior to joining Blue Cross, Dr. Simmer served as Vice President for Health and Medical Affairs for the Health Alliance Plan. He earned his bachelor's degree also from the University of Michigan and his medical degree from Wayne State University. Uh, joining our panel will be Ms. Carla Haddad. Uh, Ms. Haddad is the Senior Advisor on Opioid Policy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In this role, she provides high-level policy support to the Assistant Secretary for Health on the department's efforts to address opioid overdose prevention, treatment, and recovery efforts. Prior to this role, Ms. Haddad served as policy advisor to the Administrator of the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA. She earned her bachelor's degree and her master's degree in public health from the University of Michigan. And then finally, we'll be joined on the panel, panel by our keynote speaker, Rear Admiral Sylvia Trent Adams, who President Schlissel already introduced. So thank you, and please welcome our panel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's just really an honor to be here. Uh, again, I'm an alum of the University of Michigan, have a lot of friends uh, in the room, uh, so it's really exci exciting to be here today and uh, be a part of this important conversation. So I'm going to, let's see. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing uh, in the state of Michigan. And they told me to be very brief. Um, I get very passionate about this issue, but I will keep it to five minutes, I promise. And then I'm excited to uh, join, join my panelists here. So let's, let's start with the data. So in the state of Michigan, just like we've heard across the rest of the country, we've seen a significant increase in the number of deaths due to opioids, uh, opioid-related uh, uh, overdoses. In 2017 alone, we had over 2,000 deaths in the state of Michigan. As you can see, uh, the significant increase has been primarily in those synthetic opioid overdoses, so things like fentanyl, carfentanil. We've also seen an increase in overdoses related to heroin, and good news, although I think that's only the tip of the iceberg, we are seeing a slight decrease in the number of overdoses related to prescription drugs. Uh, I can tell you that every day in the state of Michigan, so that's basically this entire panel, five people, five people in the state of Michigan today will die of an opioid overdose. So this is a public health emergency. So what has Michigan's approach been to the opioid epidemic? Michigan has really um, addressed this from a collaborative, uh, a comprehensive approach, focusing on three prongs. So prevention, early intervention, and treatment. So when we talk about prevention, actually in 2018, Laura, so our, our licensing, physician licensing uh, organization here at the state, we actually started mandating that all of our physicians look at our PDMP, Prescription Drug Monitoring Program, maps uh, before they actually prescribe an overdose. Uh, I'm an ER doc in the state as well, and yes, we do have to check every time uh, we prescribe. The nice thing is we've actually eliminated some of the administrative burden, right? So doctors don't like to do a lot of things and log on to different systems. So you can actually pretty simply log on to to your electronic medical record and click the button and look in maps for a patient. So that's good. 
We've also uh, been able to get more upstream um, when, you, when it comes to working with our youth across the state, so prevention programs talking about the risk of misuse of prescription drugs. When it comes to early intervention, we actually are really working on expanding access to screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. Esper, I'm sure you hear about that all day. So we actually are, uh, with our various collaboratives across the state, getting money out so that we can actually screen pregnant women and get them screened and into treatment, preventing not just deaths for the pregnant mom, but making sure that our babies are not being born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. And then, as we've talked about uh, earlier, we're expanding access to naloxone. Our Michigan State Police are now actually carrying naloxone, and we are working with partners, University of Michigan and others, to expand access to naloxone. So I've been in this job at the state of Michigan not even four weeks, um, but I'll tell you, I've got, I've got a vision, and I've got some things that I want to work on. Um, so if I get in trouble, um, you know, I, I apologize, but this is what I want to do. I, I, First and foremost, I think we really need to focus on primary prevention strategies. And what do I mean by that? Naloxone and treatment alone will not get, this out of, get us out of this epidemic. If you talk about, we, we often talk about, okay, addiction, we should treat it like a disease, not a moral failing. What does that mean? If you look at diabetes, we don't say our, our, our goal for, for diabetes and preventing deaths from diabetes is just insulin, whether you're taking insulin at home or if you need to go into a hospital for an insulin drip. No, we talk to patients, we talk about uh, making sure you're eating you know, good foods, making sure you're exercising. That's the exact same thing we have to do for the opioid epidemic. We need to look at things like adverse childhood experiences, looking at risk factors, getting up, as upstream as possible before anyone even actually needs treatment. And of course, naloxone is great, but we can't just focus on naloxone and preventing those deaths at the last moment. We also have to remove barriers to access to treatment. And I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I'm an ER doc. I worked in several hospitals on the East Coast. And I'll never forget one patient who came in uh, unresponsive because they had actually swallowed their fentanyl patches. And so in the ER, you just kind of, you know, you, you, you focus on the patient, you try to save their lives. And I basically intubated the patient, put them upstairs in the intensive care unit. And, you know, my job was done. I went on to the next patient. Wouldn't you know, Three months later, that same patient came into another ER that I worked in with an opioid overdose. And what did I do? Again, I'm an ER doctor, I'm a public health professional, I promise you I care. What did I do? I basically you know, watched the patient for about four hours in the ER, they were awake at that time, and standard of care really in the ER nowadays is really if they're okay to send home, you actually can. And if they wanna go home, you send them home. I sent that patient home. At that time, I didn't know what else to do. There was no clear way to get that person into treatment. We have to make sure, I think that every emergency department, every hospital in the state of Michigan should have access to screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, and starting MAT in the emergency departments. And that's one of my goals. We also really need to look at eliminating unnecessary uh, barriers to access. So prior authorization, again, I don't think I've run this by Megan, my representative from the governor's office today, uh, but I think we need to get rid of prior authorization for Suboxone. <laughs> so that's something that I think we should be looking at. And then finally, we need more timely, actionable data. I've spent a lot of time in local health departments. It cannot take two years for your local communities to get access to data. We're already working on some of that here in the state with my partners, some of whom are in the room here, Dr. Cunningham. But I'll tell you, we need actionable, timely data. We need to look more granularly at what the problems are. Be able to look at what are some of the disparities. Maybe something that works in one community, such as the Upper Peninsula, won't work in a place like Detroit. But we need to make sure that there's timely, actionable data available for communities so that they can target uh, their, their strategies based on what the data shows. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Simmer. I'm excited to be a part of the conversation today. Uh, so here we go. Thank you. It might sound unusual, but coming from the health plan, I'm going to be agreeing with all the other speakers. And um, my responsibility at Blue Cross is managing the professional payment process. And while that is overwhelmingly popular, it does have its um, sort of problems. And one of them that you may not be aware of is that the payment model 
for medical services is about the most anti-innovative uh, approach that there can be. All the providers are stuck within a payment model that says you must provide the service as described in the coding manual or you can't bill for the service and get paid. To bill for a service that you didn't deliver is actually a criminal offense. So how more restricted can that be? One of the things that's obvious from this crisis is that we are going to have to innovate and change if we're going to succeed. And my job is to partner with the people who are experts in the care model to understand what the care model needs to be sustained and then create a payment model that both sustains it and supports it. Because right now, we have several areas in this crisis where there is lack of, where the, the care model as it exists today is not helping us out. So the first thing is, is, is uh, exposure to opioids. And that is from a prescription perspective. And many of the older studies do show a very high correlation between those who suffer overdoses and have uh, opioid substance use disorder and the original exposure being through a, a medical event. Uh, you already heard from Dr. Caldoun that we need more recent information because unfortunately that type of information came from an era where the crisis was quite different than it is today. So we are working collaboratively with M Open, where M Open um, and Dr. Um, Inglesby, who will be speaking with you later, they develop what they consider to be the best practice and they do the studies to guide best practices and then we work to create a payment model that accelerates the implementation of that uh, best practice throughout the state. Uh, we also need, uh, as was mentioned, there are levels of opioid prescriptions that are much more dangerous for overdose, greater than 90 uh, morphine milligram equivalents in particular if that is combined with a benzodiazepine and or muscle relaxer is a much more dangerous prescription combination and we have to work to, uh, to change that prescribing pattern as well. Treatment for people with substance use disorder related to opioids is in need of major overhaul. The approach today is very episodic and has very bad handoffs. Um, Dr. Caldoun talked a little bit about the same thing as when I worked in the emergency department. The, you, you're limited, you're not connected with anything after the emergency department. And that's just not a good care strategy. Now, not only is the emergency department not connected with medication-assisted therapy, medication-assisted therapy, which is the best evidence-based approach, is not available in the vast majority of counties in Michigan. Therefore, it's not just a matter of a lack of handoff, it's a lack of availability of a core important care process. And so we are working um, with the innovators at the University of Michigan, as well as Dr. Beecroft, who's a psychiatrist at Blue Cross, to change the care model uh, that starts with sort of acute detox and actually create from an episodic system something that's much more continuous and reflective of the fact that you're dealing with a, chron a chronic long-term condition. And there are no sort of special things. We do need to shore up the Suboxone and, and the other things, but we fundamentally need to train and support providers throughout the state in medication-assisted therapy. And then finally, I want to also emphasize a point that was made, we are frequently trying to make decisions based on old information. And fortunately, Dr. Cunningham has been working on a project to get more real-time information related to opioid overdose. And you saw how this problem is evolving to involve a lot more methamphetamine use and other agents. Well, that evolution is going to continue, and it's very difficult for our medical examiners to know which substance contributed to the overdose. That requires laboratory information, connectivity, and so forth, and an enormous amount of progress is being made under her direction to 
to get that information to us. And I do believe that as we do things that impact this problem, there's going to be a lot of evolution, and if we don't, aren't connected to knowing how things are changing, we won't be able to respond appropriately, and it will delay the success in managing this crisis. Uh, John, are you, are you next to, to introduce the next speaker? Or? No, I think now we'll begin our panel discussion. Oh, okay, very Thank good. You, Dr. Thank you. So, John? So we're going to start with a few questions and discussion among our panel. And uh, as uh, Dr. Brummett mentioned earlier, we'll be taking questions either by text messaging or if you hold a, a card up with your questions, one of our event staff will pick it up and bring it up to the front and we'll uh, then take those questions uh, here from our uh, colleagues at table six. Uh, posed to the panel. So we want this to be an interactive discussion, but just to get us going, uh, Dr. Simmer, uh, you concluded with the notion of change, and I think that was part of each of our uh, first three presentations today. It's for each of you on the panel, as you look at sort of what's changing about the epidemic, what makes you hopeful that we're making progress, and what worries you that we're not making progress fast enough? And Dr. Khaldun, maybe I'd start with you. Uh, I think what's promising, I mean, when I was in Baltimore, I worked a lot with, with clinicians and, and you know, doctors talking about, you know, you can do something, you can co-prescribe naloxone, uh, let's address appropriate prescribing. And initially, you would get a lot more pushback, I think, from, from clinicians, not understanding, well, why would I be, you know, starting MAT in the ER? That's, that's crazy. But now, you know, fast forward five, six years, it's not abnormal for people and, do and doctors to be talking about that. So I think we're seeing um, great strides with the clinician uh, community. Great. And anything that continues to worry you now that we're not making progress quickly enough? Well, the data, even though it's a couple mm -hmm. years old, but <laughs> the data worries me, obviously. Uh, and I think that our system, as Dr. Simmer mentioned, I think the system is still, is still broken. It's just, it's easier to get a prescription for an opioid than it is to get into treatment. And I think that's a problem we have mm -hmm. to address. Great. Others? I think one of the issues is we don't have a clear idea of what is the best practice. And remember, we've got all of the clinicians who are trying to reach that, but they don't know what is the destination. So uh, I call up a fair number of oral surgeons who have very high opioid prescribing rates for uh, patients who are 18 years old. And sometimes for third molar extraction, the amount of opioids prescribed is really uh, amazing. And so when I speak with the oral surgeons, they say things like, well, I used to give 40 tablets and now I'm down to 20. And they feel like they've made a lot of progress, but the white paper from the uh, maxillofacial um, surgeon society calls for use of alternating acetaminophen and non-steroidals. So 20 milligrams isn't the target. But that's what they were comfortable doing, cutting it in half, but they don't realize that they have to cut it in half and cut it in half and then eliminate it. And so we have to continue guiding. People aren't going to be uh, comfortable going from 40, milligram, 40 tablets to zero right at the beginning, and we need to keep the progress going. Uh, otherwise, the, the number of stored drugs that are available for diversion and so forth is, is just too high. So it's going to take a while for us to, to work on this, and I just hope that we have cycles of learning that are fast enough that that doesn't um, occupy t um, too much time. So thank you. So a story of hope and concern so sort of within, yeah. within one, one pattern that we've seen. Admiral Trent Adams. Thank you. One of the, one of the um, inspirational points of this is that we're seeing two things. Yes, a decrease in the number of deaths associated with opioids, um, and we're also seeing a level of innovation. I think there are some models that are being developed now that are interprofessional, um, engaged with the community, that would be very successful in helping rural and urban communities address their problems at the community level, and I think those are going to be the most successful interventions. Mm -hmm. Now, what worries me is the trend in the data around methamphetamines, and I don't think we're keeping our eye on the prize for having real-time responses to the data in a way that is actionable and yielding real-time results. I do hope that we're able to work with law enforcement, work with providers, and work with community leaders as well as both public and private 
to be able to have these real-time rapid response teams to be able to intervene whenever we see a trend in the data, whether it be back to fentanyl, back to um, or shifting to methamphetamines, that we have a very actionable response to be able to get on top of this as quickly as possible. But that does keep me up at night. And just to elaborate a bit on um, the Rear Admiral's comments, I think we're seeing a lot of progress in many areas. However, one thing that's concerning to me is the state-to-state -state variability. Recognizing that every state is different, they collect dif data in a different way, and seeing the concerning trends in some states um, and others and all the variability going on. We recognize, obviously, their suite of evidence-based interventions. Um, that we continue to support and emphasize medication-assisted treatment coupled with psychosocial you know, services and recovery support, um, thinking about the holistic approach to care. Um, we know that obviously naloxone is very helpful in communities, but really wrapping our heads around what suite of interventions are going to make the most impact, recognizing that it might be very effective in one state, but you know, another state is, you know, has a different demographics and different needs and kind of um, recognizing the complexity of the United States as a whole and the, the extreme variation that goes on across states. Thank you. And our panel represents the perspective of payers, federal, state, and, and private sector payers. So we have the Federal Department of Health and Human Services, which oversees the Medicare program, the State Department of Health and Human Services that oversees Medicaid in partnership with the federal government, and then our largest private payer in Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan. Um, I wanted to turn to actually a, a, a quote, uh, Rear Admiral Trent Adams, from your presentation where you said, the most common reason for opioid misuse is pain. And if we think about sort of the genesis of this epidemic um, and the role of providers and payers in pain management, both acute pain and chronic pain, I'm a primary care physician. We deal with these issues every day, every week, and we work with partners in emergency departments, in surgical specialties, uh, a whole range of clinicians. Uh, what can payers be doing to improve the management of pain in the United States? Because my concern is that until we develop better approaches to pain, we'll continue to have a, sort of a, a, a new group of, of, of people uh, developing opioid misuse problems because their pain is not well managed. And well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. How do we get here? And it wasn't just from overprescribing. It was from, I was an oncology nurse, and I remember having cancer patients with devastating pain and unable to manage it. And then seeing a lot of what was happening in the hospice settings, people having unmanageable pain. And then Joint Commission became, it became, it became one of those items that you had to pass. So we started to focus on pain, but I think we lost sight of how to manage pain. Many providers don't learn academically or in practice how to assess pain, how to control pain, how to manage it from a, um, from a clinical standpoint, and definitely having accurate feedback from patients about when pain is, how pain is managed and what's accepted culturally as it relates to pain. So that's one side of it. But I do think that having um, a holistic approach, pain medication, writing a prescription is not going to be the answer. In many cases, there are alternative therapies that are just as effective, even more effective, and we're seeing a lot of this data um, knowing the models from the Department of Defense, we use the Air Force specifically has a, a significant um, push towards using acupuncture, using um, biofeedback with some of our veteran in the veterans population, and I think has been very successful. We need to be open to looking at alternative solutions to pain, but also understanding we need to improve our clinical um, training around pain management. And from a And not be afraid to, th to, to raise the flag. And I think there are so many cases whereby there is a lack of knowledge, a lack of exper expertise, that we don't acknowledge it for what it is. It's simply just a gap in the knowledge, not a failing on, the, on behalf of the provider. So we need to not you know, ostracize providers because they don't have this level of knowledge. They just weren't trained on it. And then have, from the payer perspective, I think being more broadly uh, accepting of what really works to control pain, and then if and then being able to integrate that into the reimbursement model because there are a lot of things that work we can't get reimbursed for. So I think that needs to be put on the table as well. Thank you. I'd like to add that in the sort of category of everything you know is wrong, we were um, trained to use opioids 
um, in a manner that isn't supported by the evidence as to, as to their ability to control pain. And I think we undersell the effectiveness of non and acetaminophen um, relative to the opioids. Um, at the University of Michigan, a study was done uh, for Blue Cross patients that showed that for 12 procedures, uh, for patients who had not received an opioid prescription in the six months prior to the procedure, um, an average of 6% across 12 procedures were still taking opioids prescribed three months later. So this risk of continued opioid use was never really part of what we learned. And the risks, the, the benefit to risk ratio was unfortunately um, sort of sold as a, a much safer set of medications than what they really are. Now, unlearning that and replacing those ideas with, with other ideas about approaching pain through non-pharmacologic means and using non-opioid prescriptions is, uh, or uh, over-the-counters um, really, needs to, really needs to move forward. And I'll just add, from an acute care setting, I, what I see, and you know, I, I work with medical students and residents, uh, sometimes, um, not often, usually we can use non steroidals You could be using regional anesthesia in the emergency department. But what I found is that sometimes our trainees, they haven't been taught if you need to use an opioid, what's even the appropriate dose, right? You don't go from two milligrams of morphine to two milligrams of dilaudid. Um, so let's, I, I stop them sometimes and say, okay, let's talk about that. <laughs> and so why did you choose this dose? So I think overall we need to be teaching in an acute and outpatient setting, the appropriate way to treat and, and manage pain. Mm -hmm. And we'll uh, pose one more question and then we'll see if we have any questions from the audience. Um, when we think about uh, treating substance use disorders, how important is it to eliminate the stigma mm -hmm. that we, we too often have with those conditions uh, so that people will tr seek treatment more quickly? I mean, it's incredibly important. Um, I, I think something that um, I often talk about is, you know, the opioid epidemic, it may be new for some communities, but there are urban communities, you know, primarily African-American communities that were struggling with heroin decades ago. And it wasn't really an issue uh, back then. And that's all about kind of how we, how we look at certain communities, um, how we address stigma. Um, it's still a challenge. Uh, so I think it's something that's, that's very important. But I think we're making some progress. Others on our panel? Um, I agree. Stigma is one of the biggest challenges, um, and I equate the, the, same, the stigma with not only the opioid epidemic, but all the comorbidities of opioids, HIV, homelessness, um, all the social determinants. That stigma that is associated with um, opioids, it just ripples into every single component thereof, and you will see these individuals in the same spaces with the opioid addiction, with HIV, with hep C, homelessness, poverty. And we have to deal with it. And it's larger than opioids. Opioids is sometimes the symptom of many other conditions. And for many of my patients that I've seen, and, and clinically, um, they're, they're self-medicating with mental health disorders. And so they need to be able to identify, here is, here is a condition I'm, that I am self-medicating. Mm -hmm. We need to put that on the table, that we need to recognize how to screen appropriately for opioid abuse um, and misuse, but also understand that we need to screen for other conditions as well and deal with the stigma as a, as a whole part of the, the individual. Okay, thank you. I think there's one other point on that, and that is that we do have hopeful evidence that younger people tend to see less stigma attached to um, this and other behavioral health um, disorders. So to me, the rate limiting step in many times is not the stigma, but just the absolute lack of availability of medication assisted therapy and good longitudinal care. Uh, so uh, I hope we can discover that the stigma is not as big of a barrier when we actually have the services available for people to access. Great. Thank you. A question from our audience? Yes, there was a question about research and has there been any research into the potential unintended consequences of long-term MAT? and as well as any research into how to safely move individuals off of MAT. 
I think I can speak a little bit to MAT, but not so much the research, other than to say there is uh, information coming from MAPS um, that shows that medication-assisted therapy is both the best concept, evidence-based, but also a very dangerous therapy. A lot of patients on medication-assisted therapy do overdose, and that's because of the nature of the condition that they have. And I'm reminded as I, I ask the, the experts, what is the care model that we really want, that um, just prescribing in a medication-assisted therapy thing is not alone sufficient. There's a lot of ancillary supportive services that need to be connected with it, and those are also missing. So it's hard to know how to judge MAT as it exists today when you, when you really need both medication-assisted therapy and a range of other services to go along with it. And, um, and so it's hard for me to know. So there may be others who can speak to the research, but that's the, the situation as I see it from the plan perspective. This is a part of the, the ongoing research at the National Institute of Men, um, Mental Health at NIH. They're doing a lot of work on looking at the long-term effects of, of MAT. I want to say, though, I would echo exactly what my colleague on my panelists has, has shared. Um, it has been shown that for as relates to overdoses and deaths, individuals who are on MAT are more likely to have a, a le less likely to overdose and more likely to be um, sober if they're able to have counseling and the support services to wrap around the MAT. MAT, MAT in isolation of everything else that's needed to support these individuals, um, be it counseling, housing, transportation, and ongoing primary care. The comprehensive model is what's most successful in keeping individuals in care, keeping them um, stable clinically, and also being able to prevent overdoses and death. Very nice to see. We'll have another question. I just want to underscore the, the importance as we think about this, not just as a clinical problem, but a public health problem. And Absolutely. The, 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 the concept of social determinants of health is so important that you know, we, we, we can't treat this purely as a clinical addiction problem. We have to think about all the other social and uh, psychological needs that people need support. I think we have another question coming. We do. We have quite a few questions that are asking um, what should policymakers be focusing on? And this includes when we're talking about stigma, when we're talking about the gap between payers um, and providers, when we're talking about uh, the resurgence of methamphetamines. Um, what are some, uh, if you can just r real briefly say, what are the top policy solutions that both local governments as well as the federal government should be focusing on to address this epidemic um, widely and broadly? The most important factor that needs to be taken, that needs to be put on the table, is community engagement. Because these, those solutions will not come from the federal government, as I said before, they will not come from the state. These have to be local solutions, because you, you, get, you have one solution in Michigan, you may have one solution in Detroit, that solution that works in Michigan and Detroit will not, may not and will most likely not work in New York, Miami, or San Francisco. So we need to be focused on listening to the community, listening to the people who are impacted to build policy and make decisions about how you build that system to be able to meet their needs in real time. I have more of a plea than an answer for those of you who are in policy formation roles. I believe we don't have sufficient guidance as to how we manage addiction during pregnancy. You saw the graph of harm to children and it looked like this. I get feedback from neonatal intensive care unit uh, providers that it's not unusual for the majority of the children in the NICU to be um, treated for opioid-related um, illness. And I'm not certain what is the policy and the care plan that I need to support as a payer to make that more effective, but it certainly seems to be a crisis that doesn't have adequate guidance, and I would hope that the policymakers can sort of fill in that gap. I would add, I think we need to look at uh, 
for example, uh, MAT, I talked about prior authorization for Suboxone and removing that. Uh, there are a lot of administrative barriers for a practice for clinicians. I know this gets kind of political, but for clinicians to be however many um, patients they can actually prescribe for at any given time. Uh, the barriers as far as the waiver at the, at the federal level, that's something we need to be looking at. Uh, we need to be looking at reimbursement rates and making sure that the reimbursement rates are enough to incentivize clinicians to want uh, to prescribe MAT. I mean, there, those are some things that uh, I'll be looking at in the state and, and we should be talking about. Mr. Dad, I know you look at this from a departmental role. Uh, so what do you Absolutely. see as some of the important policy solutions moving forward? Sure. So one thing I actually wanted to expand on that a, a colleague um, said just now about the whole issue of neonatal abstinence syndrome and making sure that uh, we have appropriate payment models in place to um, provide you know, comprehensive services to pregnant women who are, who are using opioids and really wrapping our heads around that, that piece. I will say that the, uh, the, support, the Support for Patients and Communities Act that was passed this past October has uh, various provisions on um, all different you know, interventions and policies that HHS is expected to implement um, that relate to all these aspects um, of addiction. And one of the, the key, there are several sections that actually relate specifically to the issue of ne neonatal abstinence syndrome and making sure that we're really thinking through what payment models are most appropriate for this population. Um, and as was discussed earlier, CMS and through the, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation, uh, the innovation models they are putting forth, while they are more pilot tests, I think that will, you know, the results that come from those innovation models, I think will have a lot to say in terms of our path forward. And we think of some of these policy solutions coming out of state or federal government or uh, new programs from Blue Cross. We have many representatives of community organizations and local health departments here in the audience or watching online today. Are, are there any specific programs that any of you would want to highlight that sort of local or community leaders should be looking to learn more about in terms of some of the funding opportunities, uh, programs that they can connect with, training opportunities, anything that you might want to highlight for our broader audience? So I can, I can uh, provide one example, and I think it was actually stated this morning during the welcome remarks um, around the state opioid response grants that SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, uh, puts forth. Um, significant investments have been made to states across the country. I think just this last year, uh, $1.4 billion have gone out uh, toward this initiative. And really the key to this is to provide states with the flexibility to use that money according to the needs, again, of, of uh, their population and, and the crisis that's impacting their particular state. So you, they can you know, use their judgment to um, use the, the investments and be flexible in terms of thinking through what prevention, treatment, and recovery services are needed for their population. So I think that's one um, outstanding um, investment that you know, states and local communities can be taking advantage of. And I would highlight using the Medicaid waiver program mm -hmm. to be able to target specific populations with special needs and, and leveraging that opportunity to increase reimbursement and to create some creative models for delivery to be more comprehensive in the approach in any given jurisdiction. I would say it's very important to work closely with the community. I mean, it's, it's nice we all have degrees and titles, but it's really important to work with folks who may be in recovery, may have either themselves or family members who have, have struggled with addiction. Uh, something we did in Detroit actually was to engage uh, some of our partners, youth organizations, Detroit, Detroit Recovery Project, and actually work with them on uh, actually voice stories. So they actually came and spoke to people about their experiences uh, and, and helped support the community in that way and getting naloxone out, encouraging people to get access access to treatment. Me coming in and saying it is one thing, but someone who's had an experience, a person who experience is another, and it's important that we engage the community. And you know, for those of us who are in the, the, the research world, I think it, you know, we've talked a lot about data. We've seen some very important quantitative data in the presentations today, but the qualitative piece of, of learning the stories of the people affected you know, themselves by addiction or overdose or the family members and community members and friends of, of, of people who are. 
I think that's how we move policy is, is a combination of sort of good quantitative and good qualitative data. And I know, you know that's something for the researchers in the audience. You know, many of, are already sort of working in, in those domains, but to, the more we can tell those stories and pair it with some of the state or national or local data on what's happening in communities, I think we can, we can really sort of keep the policy momentum moving forward. So uh, another question from our audience. Okay. I think I'd like to add one point about the need for us to learn from the people delivering medication-assisted therapy what they need um, in terms of the support to allow them to be successful. Because as we go about trying to fill in the, the gaps geographically, if we just change the payment model, which we clearly need to do, but we don't provide them the support We've got to listen to them to make sure that we're simultaneously meeting their needs because that's a very difficult role to play, being out in, the, in a rural area without support, um, trying to effectively manage medication-assisted therapy with inadequate surrounding support. And so because it's multifactorial, I really want to get on the learning curve with supporting it financially, but then looking at the other elements that need to be in place for us to be successful in, in scaling up that type of treatment successfully throughout um, all, the, all the geographies in Michigan that currently don't have it. Thank you. I want to take us back to a point, uh, Dr. Khaldun, that, that you raised about the, the equity and health disparities and sort of unequal access to treatment. Actually, uh, one of our colleagues here at the University of Michigan, Dr. Pooja Lagasetti and, uh, uh, and, uh, and other colleagues, uh, published a study in JAMA Psychiatry just this week uh, showing that there are very large racial disparities in uh, outpatient visits for buprenorphine therapy uh, to treat opioid use disorders. And white patients are about four times more likely to receive those visits for buprenorphine treatment than African-American patients. So what can we do to bring equity into in, this issue, and, and, and how can we address some of those disparities that, that the data are starting to show us? Well, I think one of the challenges is, again, um, understanding our own inherent bias when we're, when we're caring for patients because a lot of what we see in the community is often a mirror to what is happening downstream. Um, there are a number of, of ways in which we could engage with the community to understand how to better meet the needs of, an, of a given population. In many communities, we see that even when you have better understanding of the community itself, have providers represent the community, having a cultural understanding of, of, of the needs of individual populations, but we really have to use data to drive decision making. This data, that data set um, applies to so many other, popu other medical issues, not just with um, buprenorphine prescriptions, but it applies to mental health, access to mental health treatment. It also applies to um, being able to get cardio cardiovascular care. We have health disparities in this country that run along racial ethnic minority lines. We have to stand up and be able to say that and be able to change our behavior as providers, change our behavior as policymakers, and understand that there are different practices that we need to put in place, different safeguards we need to have in place to specifically address the needs of the communities that we serve. And that we won't be ever be able to get a around that until we unpack it for what it is. It is tr it's some of it's discrimination, some of it is an inherent bias, and some of it is just not understanding the needs of the populations that we serve. But we have to be able to deal with it. I mean, it's, the data speaks for itself. Um, we know this is a long historical challenge that we've had in this country, and we need to be able to address the, the gaps in access for minority groups. We also need to look at the gender race gaps as well, because in some populations, women are less likely to be offered um, treatment for substance use disorder than men. You see it uh, also in urban versus rural populations. There, th that is a more of a provider supply and demand um, situation. but. We need to be able to address all those disparities, not just racial and ethnic, but all of them in, in the context of improving access. Mm -hmm. Any other members of our panel? Thank you. Okay. We have and a question so there from were the audience. A few more questions from the audience. Um, it was great to hear about holistic approaches. How are we trying to learn more about those? And is there active research being done to understand how pain is managed outside of the U.S.? Specifically, how does the U.S. opioid use compare with other countries in the world? 
Well, I think we, we heard that 82% of the opioids prescribed worldwide are prescribed in the United States. So I think we're a much lower percentage of the people on the planet than that. And so we have an enormous um, high prescribing use. And when uh, the, co the colleagues that we work with from the University of Michigan contacted their UK counterparts, very often when the question was asked, what dose of opioids do you use? And they said, opioids? We don't use them in this context. So I do believe that our care patterns relative to opioids have um, deviated from the world norm and that does seem to be associated with our unique position in the world of having this crisis more severely than is, than is found elsewhere. So I think we do have to look at the, the medical community, but one of the things that you'll find is that if you look abroad, you will find that, that the pr prescribing of opioids is simply far, far, far less, and they just don't view it as the right medical option for most of the things that we've gotten in the habit of using them for. I would echo the same. Um, Carl and I were just in Vienna at the um, Narcotics Drug Control Summit for the, with the UN and meeting with other countries, and st it's staggering to see the, the percentages of opioids in comparison to developed nations as well as for by diagnostic um, categories. Uh, there are many countries who prescribe no opioids for, for certain conditions that are there routinely prescribed for in the United States. But what's staggering is to look at the, the, not the prescribing behavior, but the models in which they use for pain management. We could learn a lot from developing nations around pain management. We could learn a lot from um, the you know, developed nations as well, industrialized nations, on how they prescribe, how they assess, and how they provide support services versus writing a prescription for pain medications and also making sure that individuals who are diagnosed with an opioid um, misuse disorder, that they're provided support as well as being offered MAT. One so more to, from the audience. Oh, yeah. uh, to piggyback on that question a little bit is, um, what are some of the possibilities for direct funding from either federal government, state government, SAMHSA, private payers, um, to really think about those social determinants of health and access to health care from everything from transportation to a doctor's appointment um, to mental health services um, and uh, housing support? So what currently are, is available and what could possibly be available? What are those innovation, innovative solutions to addressing those wraparound services? You want to talk about the initiatives? I, sure. I can say. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean, I can say it's incredibly important. Um, you can't. You name the public health issue. If you don't get addressed social determinants of health, you're not going to comprehensively address the issue. Um, one example uh, in, in Detroit, we we started a program for pregnant moms including screening them for substance use disorders, but we also were able to get them access to uh, rides. So we give them all a free lift ride, basically, so to their prenatal appointments. We work on getting them housing. We have uh, developed these robust screening protocols to make sure that those pregnant moms are getting into treatment, including addressing the issue of neonatal abstinence syndrome. So again, I think any uh, comprehensive approach to the opioid epidemic has to address social determinants of health. And, and I will also add to that, there, there are a number of models that have been very successful in being able to have better health outcomes and um, in different, for different diagnostic conditions. My background primarily, most of my career, I worked in the HIV space in Ryan White. The Ryan White program developed a comprehensive model. The statutory language required that we provide support services in addition to clinical services to include the diagnostics and um, referrals for specialized care. We need to have a similar model for, for everything that we, for in the primary care setting. And, not, and I consider mental health and I see, consider substance use and misuse to be a part of primary care. We need models that are value-based. And if it works in the Ryan White model, it can work in opioids, it can work in cardiovascular, it can work in cancer. Um, the National Cancer Institute launched several studies, and this is in the mid-'80s, um, looking at how do you engage women in breast cancer treat? How do you get people to be women to be screened for breast cancer? And it was shown that when you have um, peer support, you have interventions that are related to that community, that are community-based and comprehensive in nature, but also have the follow-up care and the transition services, they're more likely to come in for their care um, on a routine basis. 
received um, the treatment in, in a window of time that is acceptable, acceptable for a, a, a good outcome, and they're more likely to come back for, for follow-up care. Those studies um, dated, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> um, and it dealt with a lot of the social determinants in those communities that were able to launch new initiatives and new um, models around um, cancer awareness and cancer education uh, it combined with, with the care and treatment. But one, one thing I want to say, these models were very community focused and we have to look at models that engage not just the clinical element. We have to talk about, yes, the social determinants. We need to look at the faith-based community and what the social, social connections are for individuals to be successful because they live in these communities. Only 20% of care is delivered in a tertiary care facility. The other 80 is provided in the community. We have to understand how the community wraps around the patient for them to be successful, in, in, especially in substance use disorder. And being able to galvanize the, the community to be able to meet those needs of the individual clients who are, who are living in their communities, rural and urban. And in terms of the, just taking a step back and thinking about the, the various grants that um, HHS and specifically many H, uh, agencies under HHS put out each year, um, we have been really committed to focusing on, again, taking this comprehensive approach to making sure that, you know, we have community-based grants that we put out and, and making it either a requirement or strongly encouraging these uh, community recipients to be forming consortiums with you know, other partners in their community, not just on the public health side, you know, partnering with their police, you know, the police department, with school systems, um, with other grassroots organizations, really kind of forming a team of folks to, um, to get these funds to think uh, more critically and comprehensively about what their needs, their community's needs are, and um, form both a comprehensive strategy and plan in place uh, with clear measures to track their progress and then move forward in implementing, um, implementing uh, their response to the crisis in their community. So I believe the Health Resources and Services Administration um, put out a number of grants, many of them specific to rural communities, to do just that, um, providing funds for the planning phase of the projects for communities to kind of take a step back and think through what their needs are and how they can appropriately address those needs and then providing them with implementation grants for multiple years to work with other community members to, um, to you know, move forward on those plans that they had made. Uh, one example of that is the state innovation model grant that Michigan had been operating under where uh, a series of 12 questions were, that were validated and approved by um, people in the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services um, implemented through SIM in a number of communities. And I think the, the, we, we now incentivize primary care physicians with a payment of $500 if they incorporate their, these questions into their social history, but they also need to connect the answers to those questions into a data set so that we can truly understand which social determinants impact which things. It turns, we don't have social determinants information in our data sets, we look at claims. We look at things like readmissions. Well, it turns out that the single variable, variable that predicts a readmission is that the patient lives alone. Mm. And social isolation keeps coming up and coming up, but it's invisible to us in our data sets. So we need to understand which aspects, whether it's transportation, homelessness, um, social isolation, or which it happens to be that, that are impacting outcomes and then realize that we can work back from that information to uh, establish strategies that, that work effectively. We actually put $60 million of incentives to reduce the readmission rate, and the readmission rate didn't reduce because fundamentally the hospitals didn't really have a mechanism of addressing social isolation that was sort of off their um, sort of radar. And so if we want to be successful, we need to understand the determinants of why things are working the way they are. And our lack of knowledge has caused us to devote a lot of resources unsuccessfully because we just didn't understand the dynamic at work. So I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Michigan has a bifurcated physical health and behavioral health system. Do you believe better treatment and outcomes would occur if Michigan integrated these two systems? I think that's for me. 
<laughs> and the answer is yes. <laughs> that's, that's something that really excites me about, about my new job, is really looking at how we can strategically align payment models, integrate behavioral health and physical health. That's something we'll be working on at the state level. So I want to turn to our panelists for any concluding thoughts as we, we wrap up this discussion just before our break. Any, any questions that we didn't cover or, or answers that we need to pursue? I mean, I'll just say it's been a theme here, I think, in our conversation that, that public health is really collaborative work. It's not just clinical. It's not just yes. local health departments. Public health means working with state police, working with schools, working with a whole uh, ecosystem, if you will, to address health. Um, if we're going to be in the clinical area screening folks for social determinants of health, when you, then you better have a connection set up so that you can get that person you screened <laughs> into an actual, uh, whether it's a home, mm -hmm. jobs, whatever it may be. So I think really integrating and developing those systems is critical, and that's what we're talking about today. Go ahead, sir. Uh, we, on the commercial plans, we've also had this disconnect. It's not only been in the, um, the government programs, but we've noticed a significant increase in customer interest of um, reconnecting uh, behavioral health and medical surgical benefits together. And what drove that in many ways was that there have been a number of studies um, presented to customers from our health plan databases, both in Michigan and across the country, that shows that individuals with a chronic illness and a behavioral health diagnosis have average costs of $9,000 a year, whereas those with a chronic illness without a behavioral health diagnosis are at 4,500. The total cost of the behavioral health component of that $9,000 is between eight and $900. So the point is, if you are trying to manage behavioral health separately, you're losing the ability to impact those whose, whose uh, chronic medical condition is highly influenced by their ability to take the, to have the energy and the coping skills to change lifestyle and to intervene in a way that's more successful. So as that realization grows, we are seeing several positive things. One is that, that uh, our customers are bringing uh, behavior health back into their standard benefit rather than se segregating it. And they're also very receptive to uh, waiving the copay for the second visit on the same day that's behavioral health because that turned out to be a barrier to integration when you when you combine services the, the copay start to stack up and and so forth so i'm pretty optimistic on the commercial side that we're moving forward on that thank you um i want to make sure that everyone is uh, keeping in mind the unintended consequences of success because in the federal space and often in the state and local governments when you, you apply for funding to solve a problem. When, you're, when you are successful, the number of deaths go down, the number of overdoses go down. It's often viewed as you, don't know, you no longer have a problem. So you can't apply for additional funding or you're not in the same category of funding that you were before. And if you're not careful, and, and when you build out your model, building a sustainable model that is connected to every component of the community, where you're building a system of health and not a system of health care per se, uh, I want to make sure everyone understands that the, even when, when the numbers go down, we're being successful. But we need to make sure that we continue to be successful and that is building the partnerships with public and private entities, building a model that is giving a robust um, re return on investment to businesses, community leaders, as well as schools and having a level of success in the community so that we all can buy into a level of concept of health and not fall back into increasing in deaths because services are no longer available. But building models that are sustainable and fundable, not just from a grant that may be short term, but building that model so they can continue to have return on investment for the health of the community. Thanks. And the last and word. Again, I agree with all the comments stated here, but I think, again, taking a step back and recognizing, yes, this is a crisis, but thinking forward toward a more sustainable, um, you know, long-term care model, I think there are two aspects that we um, in the Department of Health and Human Services 
um, are especially, or feel will be especially important. One is again the reimbursement or the, the reimbursement piece, making sure we're reimbursing for the right types of therapy. And the second piece is the workforce piece, and we touched on that a little bit. But making sure, you know, having providers who are data wavered is just one step of the way. Uh, we've seen much data has shown that um, very very few percent of providers who have a data waiver training are actually prescribing, and making sure that these providers are equipped with care coordination teams or other supports that are needed for them um, to be you know, appropriately trained and educated on um, what goes into this kind of comprehensive form evidence-based treatment I think is going to be essential. So both the reimbursement and the workforce pieces are two areas that we are especially focusing on at the department. Thank you. Dr. Bromit. Well, join me in, in, in thanking this incredible panel for such a great opening session. So for those that didn't take a picture, I want to remind you that right inside your, your, your um, brochure today is the texting number for the questions for the subsequent panel. So if you forget, it's there. Um, we have about a 20 minute break. We're going to come back at 1030. We have incredible panels all day. So please stick around. Um, we'll be back at 1030. And again, thank you.